Now it's time for Culture Talk, where we talk about culturally relevant topics you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with biochemist Fuzzle Rana. Thank you for joining us, Fuzz. Sandra, thanks for having me. You know, we're going to be talking about a tr tricky topic, and that is a Scientific American article that says that the denial of evolution is a form of white supremacy. Ooh, that's a um, pretty difficult charge um, against anyone who might deny evolution. Um, what the author states is that the global scientific community overwhelmingly accepts that all living humans are of African descent. So first, I want to just ask that question. Um, is that a true reflection of the scientific consensus? Uh, in the short answer is yes. Uh, that what we have learned from molecular anthropology is that the oldest people groups uh, are African people groups, which means that the very first humans most likely look like African people groups look today. And um, that we know that racial differences or regional differences among humans arose relatively quickly as humans began to migrate around the world through some kind of microevolutionary type of process, but that the differences that we see amongst different people groups is really uh, superficial from a biological standpoint. So scientifically, we really are all Africans underneath our skin, mm -hmm. and our, the ancestor of all humans alive today would be, again, African people groups. And, and by the way, this is actually a point that we make uh, in uh, the book, Who Was Adam? This is also a point that we make in a, a video product that we have on the origin of the races. So this is a position we have espoused at Reasons to Believe for a number of years. Well, wonderful. So now we're, we're talking about the scientific consensus, but also the position specifically of Reasons to Believe, the organization that you represent. Um, so now that we've kind of uh, laid down our cards on, on the perspective of um, the first humans, I want to explore another point that the author makes. And she states that at the heart of white evangelical creationism is the mythology of an unbroken white lineage that stretches back to a light-skinned Adam and Eve. Um, now, I understand that artistic depiction, depictions of everything from Adam and Eve to Christ to the animals on the ark, those are all um, subject to an artist's interpretation, but it doesn't mean that that's what the Bible is actually saying. Um, and, you know, we can even counter that and say that the standard depiction of evolution shows a white man with a spear. So it's not just within Christianity that we see um, white people being represented as um, representing Adam and Eve and those key figures. Um, what I do want to ask, though, is what the Bible actually says, not an artist's depiction, but what the Bible says about the origin of races. In, in, in short, the Bible says nothing at all about the origin of races. It doesn't give us any kind of physical description of Adam and Eve, of Cain, of, of Noah, of Noah's sons. Uh, it doesn't even tell us when racial differences emerged among humans. We do know that when humanity was forced to scatter after the Tower of Babel, the languages were confounded. And I think it's reasonable to infer that this may be in the point where, you know, racial differences emerge, but the Bible is silent on that. So any inference we would draw about Adam and Eve's physical appearance or about the origin of races is just that. It's an inference that we're drawing. The text is actually silent on those issues. So what about the author's claim that um, the Bible says dark skin is a curse of Cain um, and a curse for him killing his brother? Well, I mean, sadly, th there is a history uh, in, in, among evangelicals and fundamentalists where that was a, a viewpoint that was held. This goes back to the, the 1800s and in the time of the Civil War, where there were Christians that were pro-slavery that were uh, trying to justify their pro-slavery position from the biblical text. And so they argued that the, the mark of Cain or Ham's curse was dark skin. Uh, but again, the Bible doesn't support that. This was a, an interpretation that was being advanced uh, to justify slavery. And that viewpoint persisted into the 20th century and is still found in some quarters today, sad to speak. But mm -hmm. it's important to also note that there are many biblical scholars at the time of the Civil War who were abolitionists who soundly rejected that interpretation for biblical reasons. 
And so this is a perspective that exists, but it's not a, a perspective that I would say is mainstream. Right. Well, thank you for that. I think that brings some clarity to some of the concerns that the author would rightly have if that is, a, in fact, an interpretation um, that is held among the vast majority of Christians. Um, so now to the question at hand, as far as denying evolution. So the author claims that when we deny evolution or when, when one denies evolution, that it's a form of white supremacy. And I think whenever we talk about any sort of idea, it's important to identify those terms. So what does it mean to deny evolution? And are we talking about all of evolution, like, or specifically human evolution or other forms of evolution? Well, I mean, you know, at, at reasons to believe we ex accept the idea that some facets of the evolutionary paradigm are valid, are justified, but we also point out that there are some scientific deficiency in evolutionary theory, uh, and, and this is particularly dealing with the origin of life and the origin of what we might call life's major groups. So uh, we are skeptical about facets of the evolutionary paradigm, but our skepticism is driven primarily by scientific concerns. It's not to say that they're not biblical and, and theological and even philosophical concerns that we hold, but our primary objection is scientific in, in nature. So it's not motivated really by any, anything other than really what is scientifically valid and philosophically reasonable. Well, thank you for making the distinction between the different forms of evolution. Now I wanna dive into kind of the main point that the author has, that when we deny evolution, it's a form of white supremacy. But as you've laid out, um, reasons to believe would be in agreement with the scientific consensus that humans originated in Africa. So the first humans look like what we would see today, um, what Africans look like today. Um, so you've addressed that issue and you've also addressed that the Bible is silent with regard to the origin of races, but that we can infer that it may have been um, at the Tower of Babel as opposed to being a curse, that dark skin is a curse. So you've addressed kind of all of those points, but it's still unfortunately a belief by some that Christianity is kind of in line with a white supremacist ideology. So what can Christians do to really separate and address, I think a very um, valid concern, what can Christians do to, to address that um, challenge that people might have when they say Christianity and white supremacy and white supremacist ideologies are kind of one in the same? Yeah, you know, uh, to, to answer that question, I think the first thing we need to remember is that uh, it, the primary motivation for the abolitionist movement was the idea that human beings are made in God's image, that we are all in Adam, you know, and that we are essentially created by God. And so this is a, a creationist view. Uh, and, and that was the, again, what was what was undergirding the abolitionist movement. When we look at the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s, there were many people who were Christians who would have been motivated again by the same ideals that, that I think stood against racism in our culture. And I think there are many Christians today that are standing up against racial injustice. So to me, I think that we, we want to be, you know, as Christians, uh, you know, aware of what's happening in our culture, aware of the injustices, and we want to, to stand against injustice. Uh, but to me, the, the, the easiest uh, way to, to do this ultimately is to remember that every human being is made in God's image. How we treat another human being is how we would treat God himself, because as image bearers, uh, each person is a reflection of God. And, and so, you know, if we love other people, like we would love God, that I think that is the best way, really, in a practical sense, to overcome this 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 misperception that we see. Thank you so much for that, Fuzz. I really appreciate you diving into this tricky topic. I know it's very heavy, but I think it's important, especially in this day and age. So if you'd like to find out more about this topic, go to reasons.org and search for Who Was Adam? It's a book by Dr. Fuzzle, Rana, and Hugh Ross.